Hello everyone, uh, my name is Fiona Cassidy, I'm from San Diego, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the uh, esophagus. So first of all, let's just have a look at the normal anatomy. So in the upper esophagus, you have uh, paired vallecule um, and bilateral piriform sinuses seen here. Vallecule well seen on the lateral view, piriform sinuses less well seen. And this whole area is the hypopharynx. There are three normal indentations on the esophagus. The first one is the aortic arch, seen here. The second is the left main bronchus, also better seen here, where you can actually see the lucency of the left main bronchus crossing over there and putting a little indentation on the esophagus. And the third normal indentation is the left atrium, which is going to be more marked in patients who have a large left atrium. So aortic arch, left main stem bronchus, and left atrium, those are the normal impressions you will often see on the esophagus. Note here on the double contrast esophagram, the normal mucosa is very featureless. Look at the, let's look at the lower esophagus. There are two normal muscular rings in the lower esophagus. The first one is the A-ring, which you often don't see. You often only see it when there is very well, when the esophagus is very well distended. So this is unusual to see it quite as well as this, but this is where it is. It's a normal anatomical structure. The space in between the A and the B ring is called the vestibule. The B ring is usually located, is, is located right at the G junction, just a, a millimeter above the histological G junction, which is called the Z line. So it usually should be right at the diaphragmatic hiatus down here. And usually you don't see it that well unless there's a hiatal hernia, like in this case. So this whole area is hiatal hernia as the stomach is pulled. So that we know that the Z line is should be just below the B-ring, so we know that the Z-line is here, so all this is stomach. So you usually only see the B-ring this well when there's a hiatal hernia. And be aware that the diaphragmatic hiatus, where the, where the G-junction is normally located, is, uh, will be located quite a bit below the diaphragm, because these images are always performed obliquely. So when you're performing these esophagrams, make sure you go low enough that you don't stop at the diaphragm. Make sure you go all the way down to the diaphragmatic hiatus. Okay, so let's look at some cases. So this is going to be our first case. Key imaging findings are multiple small flask-like outpouchings seen here. What is the diagnosis? So this is a case of intramural pseudodiverticulosis. What is that, you ask? Well, is it A, B, C, or D? So the answer is B. So these are not true diverticula, these are actually dilated submucosal glands with enlarged ducts and the contrast fills those enlarged ducts. Who gets this? Well, it can be associated with several, condition, several other conditions. Not all of these, so which ones do you think are associated with intramural pseudodiverticulosis? So the answers are distal stricture, candida, GERD and alcoholism. The most important of these is, is our, our distal stricture in Canada. That is what it's most associated with. And very important to look carefully for his distal stricture whenever you see these intramural sites, pseudodiverticula, because um, it may be subtle and it, it, they're highly associated. So always give a barium tablet um, to look for that stricture if you see these intramural pseudodiverticula. It's also highly associated with Canada, so make sure you get good double contrast um, images to look for filling defects, linear filling defects from candida. So this, these are both the same patient in the lower esophagus. He did have a benign appearing peptic stricture, and he also had evidence of candida. It was a patient who had HIV and had candida. Next case, a 59-year-old patient with HIV. The predominant feature here, remember I told you that the, the mucosa of the esophagus should be very featureless. Here it is very irregular. We've got these linear filling defects, multiple linear filling defects, some other little patchy areas of maybe ulceration. And also you see all these little outpouchings, which are intramural pseudodiverticula, like in, like, I, uh, like in that previous case. And this is another case of candida esophagitis. So these patients present with a dynophagia or painful swallowing. It's usually in patients who have either HIV or diabetes. In the acute phase, often you just see the filling defects. The plaques, those are the, the thrush plaques, the candida white, those white plaques 
In the chronic phase, the esophagus tends to look very shaggy. So this phase, this phase, this phase is a little more uh, chronic, where it's starting to have a shaggy appearance. Because in these cases, you have both plaques, ulcers, and intramural pseudodiverticula. It gives the esophagus a, a shaggy appearance. Another example, acute phase, which is linear filling defects, all these linear lucencies. In the chronic phase, a very shaggy appearance to the esophagus due to the combination of plaques, ulcers, and intramural pseudodiverticula. Candida esophagitis. Okay, let's look at another case where, there, where there's multiple filling defects in the esophagus. This was a 75-year-old male who was asymptomatic, so unlikely to be candida. Also, you'll notice the filling defects are more rounded here, whereas they are linear in candida. This is glycogen zacanthosis. Don't know if you've heard of that before, but it's actually quite common in the elderly population. They're seen in up to 6% of endoscopies. We tend not to see it quite as often as that on an esophagram, but it's, um, the EGD is a little more sensitive for detection of this finding. It's associated with Cowden syndrome. Cowden syndrome is one of the polyposes where you have hamartomas really throughout the body and little pearl uh, for multiple choice questions. Cowden syndrome is the only polyposes that affects the esophagus and it affects it by, uh, they, they, have, they get glycogen zacanthosis. So none of the other polyposes will affect the esophagus, which is good to be aware of. So glycogen, the pathology of glycogen zacanthosis is that there is proliferation of squamous cells filled with glycogen. And just don't confuse it with candida. Candida, the filling defects will be more linear and the patient will be symptomatic. They will have painful swallowing. Another example, rounded filling defects with glycogen zacanthosis, linear filling defects of candida. This is another example, another uh, case where we have rounded filling defects, multiple, multiple, innumerable rounded filling defects. And this is, this is a tough case. This is quite rare, but it's good to be aware of it. This is squamous papillomatosis. So small squamous papillomas or warts are benign epithelial tumors that are occasionally seen uh, scattered throughout the esophagus uh, during endoscopy. But diffuse disease, as in this case, is called papillomatosis. That is more rare. It's, it may or may not be it, so with HPV. It's, HPV uh, virus is not always found coexisting with this, so this is a rare condition, be aware that this is a marked a high risk factor for squamous cell carcinoma. So be aware these patients should be screened for development of, squ of squamous cell carcinoma. And this is also associated with respiratory papillomatosis, which is actually more common than esophageal papillomatosis. Okay, moving on. So we saw multiple cases of candida. Now look, let's look at some other cases of infectious esophagitis. So what do you think of the image on the left? There are multiple small, very small ulcers. You see them scattered throughout the mid esophagus here. When you see multiple small ulcers, what do you think of? Particularly if this patient has a history of painful swallowing. This is herpes simplex virus. So think herpes simplex virus when you see small ulcers. What about when you see large ulcers, particularly giant ulcers? See some of these ulcers here. If you look closely, see this one here. So very large ulcers here. And I can give you a little more history. This patient has a history of HIV. And this was cytomegalovirus. And actually the HIV virus itself can also give you giant ulcers. So small ulcers think herpes, giant ulcers think CMV or HIV virus itself. What about this one? Multiple medium sized ulcers in the esophagus. And we also have ulcers in the terminal ileum with a cobblestone appearance. Can you put these findings together? Crohn's esophagitis. So these are aphthous ulcers in Crohn's disease. So be aware that Crohn's um, disease can affect any part of the, the gastrointestinal system from the mouth to the anus. Two different patients who both were taking medications. So this is pill esophagitis with ulcers seen in this case from a patient taking potassium chloride. And this patient on the right was taking tetracycline. Even one of my residents who was taking tetracycline for acne when he was a teenager told me he developed severe es esophageal ulcers from, from tetracycline. So definitely, definitely is a, a real thing. Okay, moving on, 30 year old white male presenting with dysphagia. There was an area of focal stenosis in the distal esophagus. 
with ring-like narrowings. It almost looks like a trachea, doesn't it? That area. And this is eosinophilic esophagitis. What is eosinophilic esophagitis, I hear you say? Well, it's an abnormal response to allergens. It's been, it's actually only been quite recently recognized and uh, more and more has been learned about it all the time, but it's thought to be due often to a food allergen. At histology, when a biopsy is taken, there's greater than 15 eosinophils per high powered field. Typical patient is a young white male, and they often have coexistent GERD. It's not really known what the, um, why they're so associated. So on imaging, this is another case of eosinophilic esophagitis, more subtle case where there's not actually stricturing, but you see these multiple rings in the esophagus. You see them persistently throughout the exam. You might say, oh, well, I've seen cases of feline esophagus. Could, that be, uh, could this be feline esophagus? Well, no, feline esophagus, the, the transverse bands are closer together and it's very transient. This was seen all throughout the exam on every, on every phase and every position. Okay, so that's how you distinguish it from feline esophagus. Feline esophagus will be very transient and only seen temporarily during the exam. This is another example of eosinophilic esophagitis. So again, persistent on every phase of the exam. This is a motility disorder that we just talked about. Here we have thin transverse bands, so different from the rings we just saw in eosinophilic esophagitis. The findings, I can tell you, were transient. They didn't, were not seen throughout the exam. When the patient changed position, they disappeared. And this is feline esophagus. So this is, can be normal, but is commonly associated with reflux, and it is normal appearance of the esophagus in cats, which is why it's called the feline esophagus. Next case, very disorganized, corkscrew type appearance to the esophagus. And this appearance is often associated with chest pain, or so-called diffuse esophageal spasm, which is the clinical entity that this is associated with. So this is a severe esophageal dysmotility or presboesophagus, and it often causes appearance of a corkscrew esophagus when it's very severe. Okay, moving on to the next case, very dilated esophagus, bird's beak appearance of the distal esophagus at the G junction. Diagnosis. This is primary achalasia. So what is primary achalasia? What is the underlying pathophysiology? So the answer is D. It's destruction of the nerves in the myoenteric plexus with distal esophagus, causing abnormal relaxation of the G-junction. And it's not really understood why this happens, which is why it's called primary achalasia. This is a companion case of a dilated esophagus, but here we do not have the bird's beak at the G-junction. We have a wide open G-junction. Here you can see the dilated esophagus on CT and bibasal lung fibrosis. In the small bowel, you can see the valvae conventi are much closer together than normal. Normally you have about six valvae conventi per inch in the jejunum, and this is far more than that. So this is the so-called hideband appearance. Can you put all these findings together? This is scleroderma. So with scleroderma, you get esophageal dilatation with the wide open G junction, so you usually get gastroesophageal reflux. In the small bowel, you get increased number of valvulate conventes, again seen here on this small bowel enema, um, giving you the hideband appearance. And this is because there's fibrosis of the longitudinal muscle in the small bowel, which causes pulling together of all the valvulate conventes, and that's why they are closer together than normal. The small bowel is also dilated, but non-thickened. And scleroderma is also associated with the anti-mesenteric small bowel pseudodiverticula due to areas of wall weakness. Another companion case to our achalasia case, again, dilated esophagus. And this one, we do have a somewhat of a bird's beak at the distal esophagus. This distal, the, the G-junction did not open properly. This patient had a history of tra recent travel to South America. And this is Chagas disease. So Chagas disease, a parasitic infection caused by Trypsinoma cruzi and it's spread by, the, by kissing bugs. The infection has acute and chronic phases. In the acute phase, there's myocarditis and inflammation of smooth muscle of the bowel, both in the colon and the esophagus. In the chronic phase, this is where you get weakness, 
uh, in the in the in the um, heart you get dilated cardiomyopathy in the esophagus you get esophageal dilatation just like achalasia and you can get a chronic megacolon in the, um, in the large bowel Okay, so let's look at some other esophageal strictures. So by far the most common esophageal stricture, particularly when it uh, has a benign appearance, is a peptic stricture. So this is 80% of all strictures. And it will be smooth, tapered, narrow, with no mucosal irregularity, no shouldering. Think of Zollinger ellison when it's a very, very long, very severe peptic stricture. And caustic ingestion is also a cause of a long, uh, narrow stricture. Other things that can cause strictures are radiation and chronic NG tube um, intubation. What are the manifestations of esophageal reflux? That is, this is a common indication for um, doing esophagrams to look for reflux and look for complications of reflux. So we need to know what to look for. And I think a lot of people do struggle with that. So this is why I always tell my residents, I really want good double contrast images of the lower esophagus, because I want to look for these little linear ulcers. You can also get little round ulcers as well. I find these transverse linear ulcers are often the easiest to see. So this is what I'm mainly looking for. With this, any esophagitis, you can get thickened longitudinal folds, but I don't find that very useful sign as I commonly see this just due to under distension. Seeing an inflammatory pseudopolyp is very indicative of chronic reflux. So this is just a hypertrophied fold at the G junction, and it's very characteristic for um, inflammatory pseudopolyp. You don't need to do to recommend endoscopy when you when you see this finding, as it's very characteristic. Just another example of reflux esophagitis, just so you get used to, to looking for the findings here. So you can see these transverse white bands of barium. These are linear ulcers that are accumulating barium. And you've seen a little bit of puckering here on this side. So we're starting to get a little bit of scarring and fibrosis there. So I, this is probably the, the start of a stricture that down, if, if this, his, his reflux doesn't get treated, he may go on to have a stricture. Okay, what about this case? We have a stricture in the mid esophagus. It looks benign appearing. There's no mucosal, um, no mucosal abnormality. We see a very strange appearance of the distal esophagus. Remember we said the esophageal mucosa should be very featureless. Here it's very reticular, maybe glandular. You'd be more expect to see a mucosal pattern like this in the stomach. So any thoughts of what the diagnosis is here? You probably guessed it. Barrett's esophagus. So Barrett's esophagus is columnar metaplasia of the lower esophagus as a response to chronic reflux. When you see reflux esophagitis, about up to 10% of those patients will have Barrett's. So when I see findings of reflux esophagitis, I always suggest that they consider getting endoscopy to look for Barrett's. I always recommend endoscopy when I see a peptic stricture, when I see any type of stricture, even if it looks benign, because up to 40% of cases of a peptic stricture will have associated Barrett's. While I'm showing you a very nice example of Barrett's on esophagram, a lot of times we won't be able to make the di diagnosis of Barrett's by esophagrams. So they do need EGD. And if you have Barrett's esophagus, uh, up to 10% will get adenocarcinoma. That's why it's very important to, to diagnose it early. So characteristically, patients with Barrett's esophagus get a high peptic stricture. So normally peptic strictures are in the lower esophagus. But I guess in this case, the columnar metaplasia protects the lower esophagus from the strictures. So they tend to get their peptic stricture higher up where the squamous epithelium is. And you get this characteristic reticular appearance or glandular appearance of the lower esophagus. Okay, what about this stricture? So here you see shouldering. So this is not smooth tapering. There's like a bump here, like shoulders. And you see marked mucosal irregularity and marked narrowing. So you would never call this a benign stricture, far too irregular. So this is esophageal cancer. What about this case? There are multiple serpentine filling defects. They almost appear like varices, don't they? Like worms. But be careful because there is a very abrupt change here and maybe some mucosal irregularity. And even when the patient changed position, these filling defects persisted, they did not change. So this is actually varicoid esophageal cancer, not to be confused with varices. Here's a case of varices, 
varices will change with the patient position. When the patient was lying prone, there was the very large varices here in the distal esophagus, some seen in the fundus of the stomach here as well. When the patient stood up, they completely changed. These ones opened out. Some of these other ones changed in shape. So varices will change with position and they usually don't cause obstruction either. Next case. Extrinsic compression of the posterior aspect of the esophagus at the level of the aortic arch. So when you see an extrinsic compression at this level, think of a vascular ring. We had a look at his CT and lo and behold, there was a vessel crossing behind the esophagus. This was an aberrant right subclavian artery. So an aberrant right subclavian artery is not the only aberrant vessel that would cross posterior to the esophagus and cause an impression on the esophagus. The differential is, so, that, so it's certainly the most common cause, but the differential also includes a right aortic arch with an aberrant left subclavian artery or double aortic arch. Now, what about if you saw a vessel crossing between the esophagus and the trachea, so causing a, a, an anterior impression on the esophagus? There's only one vascular anomaly that does that, and that is pulmonary sling. So remember that for your multiple choice questions. Next case, multiple, well, two web-like filling defects in the upper esophagus in a patient with dysphagia. You can see them persistent throughout the exam. And these ones actually, when we give a barium tablet, it got stuck right at the level of the first web-like area. So I guess I've given the, the answer away here in my description. These are esophageal webs. So esophageal webs are very thin shelf-like filling defects, usually anterior lateral. This is what they look like on AGT. So when they're just anterior lateral like this, they're usually asymptomatic. asymptomatic. But in, in, our case, in our patient, they went all the way around and were causing narrowing of the lumen and obstruction of the lumen. So when they're circumferential, they can often cause dysphagia. They're using the cervical esophagus, and as we said, they may have dysphagia if they're circumferential. They can be associated with the plumber vinson syndrome, which is a syndrome most commonly seen in women, triad of iron deficiency, anemia, esophageal webs, and esophageal cancer. Okay, and this is my last case. So double conscious esophagram shows this large polypoid lesion in the esophagus. So esophageal polyps in general are not that common, but when you see esophageal polyps, what do you think of? This is a different patient with the same diagnosis. On CT, you can see this large fat-containing polypoid lesion in the esophagus. So this is a fibrovascular polyp, or also called a fibrolipoma. And while this is a benign esophageal tumor, um, it's found in the upper esophagus, they nearly always contain fat, so fibrolipoma is probably a better name for them, but they're more commonly known as fibrovascular polyp. And even though they are benign, they can be lethal, they can bleed, but the most worrying thing is they can asphyxiate because they're often on a long pedicle. They can be aspirated into the airways or they can present, um, they can be regurgitated and present in the mouth. So very characteristic appearance. Thank you very much for your attention.